Hello, and welcome back to Deductive Logic, Phil 320. I'm Matthew Brown, and today we're going to talk about basic concepts in logic. Um, before we get into the content of today's lecture, I want to um, share another logic puzzle with you. So um, have a look at this. Uh, according to this puzzle, the figure shows a small island on which is a tree in the middle of a large and deep lake, which is 300 yards across. On the shore is another tree. How might someone who is unable to swim with only a length of rope significantly longer than 300 yards long get from the shore to the island? So that's your logic puzzle today. Um, keep that in mind as we go through the lecture and we'll talk about it again at the end. So we're going to proceed today by giving some basic concepts and definitions um, and applying them to some examples. We're not going to get into any uh, formalized logic today. Um, just going to get into core concepts. OK, and we're going to start with, I think, the most central concept in logic, which is the concept of an argument. Now, when we say argument, um, we're going to define that to mean a series of sentences. Any series of sentences will do, um, although we'll talk a little bit later about what exactly we mean by sentences. It's important. Um, but let's just start with any, any series of sentences. Um, the sentences are going to be typically split up into premises and a conclusion. Um, so uh, in the canonical form, the, uh, the, the first set of sentences in an argument are the premises and the final is the conclusion, although we'll see that it doesn't always work that way in ordinary English language uh, arguments. Now a good argument gives you reasons to accept the conclusion. Um, any kind of argument that's a good argument gives you some increased reason to accept the conclusion. Might not be a knockdown argument, but as long as the premises are true, they give you a reason to, to, to believe in the conclusion. The premises in an argument are the sentences at the beginning of the argument, as I said. Now, um, that's in a kind of canonical form which we're gonna write down when we analyze an argument. In ordinary language arguments, the premises and conclusions might be in a different order. Often you'll see a conclusion at the beginning, um, you know, kind of like the topic sentence and the premises come after. Um, but uh, we'll see a little bit about why we might or reorganize that um, when we're doing the analysis of the argument. Again, in a good argument, the premises provide reasons to accept the conclusion. Sometimes there are some indicator words or terms that, um, that tell us that a sentence is a premise. Um, here's a long list, right? Um, if you see words like since, in that, seeing that, as indicated by, because, for, as, given that, and some of these other wor uh, words and phrases, those are signals that that sentence might be a premise. Um, now, not all premises will have these indicator words, um, but they can be signs that we're looking at premises. The conclusion of an argument is the final sentence in an argument. Again, in that canonical form, right? In ordinary language arguments, the conclusion might be in a different place, maybe at the beginning. Um, sometimes, although more rarely, it might be somewhere in the middle. Um, if an argument is a good one, we sometimes say that the conclusion follows from the premises. And if it's bad, we say it does not follow, right? Um, that is to say that uh, in a good argument, the premises should sort of push you to accepting the conclusion. Conclusions can also sometimes be uh, have some indicator words that tell us that we're looking at a conclusion. Therefore, is, our, is a sort of our favorite when we're doing uh, when we're talking about logic class. But also, thus, so, hence, whence, wherefore, consequently, um, when we say something implies that something else that that something else might be the conclusion. Um, we may infer it follows that. There are many different words and phrases that might indicate a conclusion. And again, 
you might not necessarily see these indicator words, but they can be a clue when you're trying to figure out um, in an ordinary language paragraph, which is the conclusion. Let's look at some examples. So in this sentence, it says, corporate raiders leave their target corporation with a heavy debt burden and no increase in productive capacity. Consequently, corporate raiders are bad for the business community. That word consequently is an indicator word that typically indicates a conclusion, which means that the rest of this argument is a, a premise or premises, um, depending on whether we think this sentence is really one or, or multiple statements. Um, so I've got premise here in blue, conclusion in yellow. All right, let's look at another. Expectant mothers should never use recreational drugs since the use of these drugs can jeopardize the development of the fetus. Again, since here is an indicator word, right? Now, if we go back and look at the previous, uh, the previous argument, right? We have two separate sentences, grammatically speaking. One is a premise, one is a conclusion. In this argument, it's just one sentence, right? Can one sentence be an argument? Well, um, grammatically it might be one sentence, but we really have got two different thoughts forming a full argument. The sense indicator word tells us that this second half is actually our premise, and the first part is the conclusion, right? So what we want to convince you of is that expectant mothers should never use recreational drugs, and the premise that comes after the sense about the development of the fetus is supposed to give us a reason to believe the conclusion. So we see already here that sort of grammatical sentences and logical sentences don't always line up exactly the same. Let's look at a longer example. The space program deserves increased expenditures in the years ahead. Not only does the national defense depend upon it, but the program will more than pay for itself in terms of technological spinoffs. Furthermore, at current funding levels, the program cannot fulfill its anticipated potential. Okay. Um, take a minute, pause the video if you like, and try to identify which sentences are the premises and which sentence is the conclusion. Okay. Uh, let me start by using some colors to separate out different sentences here. Now you notice, for example, the first grammatical sentence, that's one sentence. Um, I've used the green and orange here to indicate that they're really two separate considerations uh, being suggested here, which we might treat as different sentences. And the purple is yet another one, right? Um, we don't have a lot of indicator words here to help us parse this. So we have to kind of think about what, what the we're trying to argue in favor of. And here I think it's pretty clear that this first, the first part in yellow is really the conclusion that the argument is trying to convince us of. So we can rearrange this in a more canonical form. We have three main premises and one conclusion. Okay. So that's kind of how we start to break down English language arguments, analyze them um, to understand their logical structure. Now remember I said uh, an argument is a series of sentences, but grammatical sentences don't always line up with logical sentences. For our purposes in this class, we're going to use a pretty restricted definition of sentence. Um, a sentence is the kind of thing, for our purposes, that can be true or false, that can be asserted or, or denied, uh, accepted or rejected. Um, when the book uh, and when I in lecture say sentence, typically we mean a declarative sentence, right? Um, one that makes uh, a statement. And indeed, some logic textbooks use the word statement instead of sentence for this. Um, other kinds of sentences like questions or interrogative sentences, imperatives or commands, uh, exclamations, right? Those are not sentences in our sense, in the logical sense. Let's look at some examples. So uh, here's three sentences. Um, Istanbul was Constantinople. That that could be true. That is true, right? That's a sentence. Um, now it's Istanbul, not Constantinople. It's very similar to the first sentence, but um, it's definitely a sentence. Whereas take me back to Constantinople 
is, uh, is, is not something that can be true or false. It's a, it's a command, right? Take me there, right? That's not a sentence, not the way we mean in this class, right? Look at these other two uh, sentences, um, or, or these other two uh, lines, four and five, and think about whether they count as sentences. Pause the video if you need to. Do you have it? So number four, a sentence. You cannot go back to Constantinople is, uh, is a sentence. Why did Constantinople get the works is a question, right? It's an interrogative sentence in grammatical terms, but it doesn't state something. It doesn't make a claim. It doesn't assert or uh, it, doesn't, it doesn't say something that could be true or false, right? Um, so that's how we're going to use sentences in this class. Next, I want to talk about the term validity, which is our kind of key way of analyzing arguments, right? Um, we say that, and, and when we talk about what's valid, we mean deductively valid. And sometimes we'll use that phrase, deductively valid. Sometimes we'll just say valid. Uh, an argument is valid if the conclusion must be true if the premises are. So to say a, an argument is deductively valid is to say that the conclusion must be true if the premises are. An argument can be valid even if the premises are false, right? Um, what we're interested in is in what would happen if the premises were true. Would the conclusion have to be true? And by contrast, we say that an argument is invalid if it is possible for the premises to be true and the conclusion to be false. It, now, it's possible that you have an argument, all the premises are true and the conclusion is true, it happens to be true, but the argument is still invalid because it's possible that it could be otherwise, that it could be that all the premises are true and the conclusion is false. Um, it's the form of the argument that tells us whether it's valid or invalid, um, not whether the premises happen to be true or the conclusion happens to be true. Now, in contrast to deductively valid arguments, we um, often make inductive arguments. An inductive argument is one that doesn't guarantee the truth of the conclusion, but that makes the truth of the conclusion more probable, right? Often inductive arguments generalize from the premises to uh, a, a more um, general and stronger conclusion. These arguments are not deductively valid, but they can still be good arguments in many contexts. Many scientific arguments are inductive in nature. Um, here's an example of a kind of interesting inductive argument. Um, it goes like this. The meerkat is closely related to the surrocat. The surrocat thrives on beetle larva. Therefore, probably the meerkat thrives on beetle, beetle larva, right? Um, this argument is not deductively valid. It is a kind of argument by analogy um, that makes the conclusion more probable, but not. it doesn't guarantee that that's, that's what the meerkat eats, right? Um, so it's a kind of inductive argument. This is often a reliable form of reasoning, and it's often used in science and other places, but it is fallible, and it needs to be checked, right? You, you, don't, you can't be sure, right? Um, the second kind of argument, let's look at this. The meerkat is a member of the mongoose family. All members of the mongoose family are carnivores, therefore the meerkat is a carnivore. This argument is deductively valid. If both the premises are true, then we know the conclusion is true, right? Um, so we say that's a deductively valid argument. Here's another example. I want you to think about whether this example and the, and the next couple of examples I give uh, are deductively valid arguments, inductive arguments, invalid arguments that aren't inductive, or not even an argument, right? So this one says, Bergen is either in Norway or Sweden. If Bergen is in Norway, then Bergen is in Scandinavia. If Bergen is in Sweden, then Bergen is in Scandinavia. Therefore, Bergen is in Scandinavia. Take a second and think about it. This is also a deductively valid argument. If all of the three premises are true, the conclusion has to be true. There's no other possibility, right? Let's look at this next argument. It is snowed in Massachusetts 
every December in recorded history. Therefore, it will snow in Massachusetts this coming December. Pause and think about it if you, if you need to figure out which kind of argument this is. It's an inductive argument. We generalize from some specific cases, all of the Decembers in history, to another case, right, this coming December. It doesn't guarantee that it's, it's true, right? Uh, it might be freakishly warm this December uh, in Massachusetts and no snow, right? Um, but it does make it pretty probable. If it's always happened before, it's likely to happen again, right? Here's another one. All odd numbers are integers. All even numbers are integers. Therefore, all odd numbers are even numbers. What kind of argument is this? This is an invalid argument. It's not an inductive argument. There's no generalization. It's not even a good argument. It's a very bad argument, right? Um, so we just say it's an invalid argument, not an inductive, not even an inductive one. Here's our last, uh, here's our last argument. Um, place your cursor in the file at the spot where you want to insert the symbol. On the insert tab, click symbol. If you see the symbol you want listed in that gallery, just click it to insert. Otherwise, click more symbols to open the symbol dialog box. Scroll up or down to find the symbol you want to insert. When you find the symbol you want, double click it. What kind of argument is that? Pause if you need to think about it. This is not an argument at all. Why? Because it is not made up of sentences. Not made up of sentences in our sense of statements or declarative sentences. These are all imperatives. These are all commands. They don't have truth values, right? They can't be true or false. So I just use this term truth value. It's a really important one for understanding sentences. Um, and the properties of sentences, right? Um, so we say that the, the, the truth value is, the, is um, the property a sentence has of being true or false. If a sentence is true, we say that its truth value is true. Um, what's the use of that? Well, it's a way of talking about a statement's truth or falsity without knowing which it is. Now it's worth uh, taking a second to talk about the word truth and how we use it in this course. Truth is sometimes a kind of intimidating term uh, in a sort of deep sense, truth with a capital T we say sometimes, the kind of truth that philosophers and theologians worry about. Um, it generally doesn't have a ton to do with what we're talking about in this class, right? We could, we don't even have to talk about truth. We could use ones and zeros in place of truth and false falsity to talk about the truth values of statements. Um, typically what we mean by, by truth is just, you know, um, you know, is it so, is it a fact? Um, do we believe it? Do we accept it? You know, we, we, there's nothing too deep um, about the concept of truth as we use it here, right? So we talk about truth values of different kinds of sentences. We have contingent sentences. They could have either truth value. They could be true or false. It depends on uh, some facts outside of the sentence itself, right? Outside of the form of the sentence itself. Um, maybe it's empirical facts. Um, maybe it's some other other kinds of information we need. We don't can't just look at the sentence and know that it's true or false. You might say, well, is, that's all sentences, right? No, there are some, for example, what we call tautologies that must be true in virtue of how they are written right? Without any reference to any other uh, underlying facts or uh, external information. We sometimes call these logical truths because they necessarily have the truth value of true. Um, and sentences that necessarily have the truth value of false, we call contradictions. A contradiction must be false just in virtue of how it is written without reference to any kind of facts. So we sometimes call these logical falsehoods. Let's look at some examples. So we say if it is raining or it isn't, right? That's a tautology, right? That is, we don't have to go outside and look to see whether it's raining or not. We don't have to check the weather report to know whether sentence one is, is true. It has to be true, right? Either it is raining or it is not, right? There's no middle possibility. You might say, well, what if it's kind of like drizzling or misting? Um, either drizzling or misting count as raining or they don't, right? Um, uh, so we might we might argue about how the term applies, but 
either the term applies or it doesn't, right? So we've, it's a tautology. Um, so that's number two. If it's raining, then it is snowing. You might say, well, I mean, is that a contradiction? Well, it's not. It's it's contingent. It it might be false. In fact, I think it is false, right? Um, it's not always the case that it's raining and it's snowing. Uh, it may be possible in some cases. Wintry mix, is that what they call it in the weather? Um, but it's raining doesn't always go along with it. it's snowing. So it, it's a contingent statement and maybe it's false, but that depends on like meteorology or, or other kinds of information about weather phenomena. Here's some more examples. Um, why don't you pause and do these on your own? Think about them for a moment on your own. Okay, do you think you have it? Let's look at these other examples. Number three says, if it is raining, I'll wear a raincoat, right? Um, that's contingent. Maybe I'll wear a raincoat, maybe I won't. Um, uh, it, it, it's, you can't tell by looking at the sentence whether it's true or false. Um, number four, it is raining and it is not the case that it is raining. Both of those things, both of those parts of the sentence can't be true at the same time. So the same reason that number one is a tautology, number four is a contradiction, right? There's a, there's a, there's, it doesn't matter. It could be, it could say anything. It, it, it is, it is snowing and it is not the case that it's snowing. We could substitute any term for raining and it would still be a contradiction, right? It's by the form of the sentence that we know it's false. Number five is a tautology. If it is raining, then it is raining, right? It's always the case that if the first part of that sentence is true, the second part is true, and we know therefore that it is a tautology. It's not possible for this sentence to be false. Lastly, um, if it is raining, then it is not raining, right? That might seem like a contradiction, um, but actually it's contingent. Right. This is a little bit of a trick question. It's it's based on how we kind of interpret if then sentences and if then statements. Um, if it is raining, then it is not raining. So if it happens to be the case that it's raining right now, right, then we know the sentence is false, right, because it can't be raining and not raining at the same time. But um, if it is not raining right now. It's not clear how to evaluate this sentence. And for reasons that we'll get into in the next unit, the way we interpret the sentence is that if it is not raining, the, the whole sentence is true, right? So it's a contingent sentence. Um, if that doesn't make a lot of sense to you, don't worry, we'll get there, okay? Logical equivalence is not a property of a sentence, but a property of two or more sentences. Not an argument per se, just a collection of sentences, right? A, a, a two or more sentences are logically equivalent if they must have the same truth values in all situations. That's how we define logical equivalence. It's, it's helpful to think about the notion of truth value in general because it, we can talk about logical equivalence without knowing whether the sentences are true or false in particular cases. Now, all tautologies are logically equivalent to each other because they're always true. All contradictions are logically equivalent to each other because they're always false. But there are actually some contingent sentences that are always uh, that are that are logically equivalent. That are the sentences could be true or false, but they're always true or false in the same situations. Right. Um, another property that two or more sentences could have is that they could be consistent or they could be inconsistent. Consistent sentences could possibly all be true at the same time. There may be other situations in which some are true and some are false, but there is some possible situation where they're all true at the same time. It, 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 it's possible, right? We don't know if it's true or not. Um, a set of sentences is inconsistent if they could not all possibly be true at the same time. Um, maybe they're all false, maybe some are true and some are false, but they can't all be true at the same time, right? Um, let's look at some examples. So number one is two sentences, sentence A, it is raining, sentence B, it is not raining. Both of these are contingent sentences and they are inconsistent 
if A is true, then B is false. If B is true, then A is false. There's no, um, there's no way that they can both be true at the same time. Example number two, A says it is raining, B says it is sunny. Are those inconsistent, consistent, or logically equivalent? They're consistent, right? You might have been outside on a sunny day where it's also raining. Maybe the clouds only cover part of the sky and the sun is shining while the rain is falling. Um, it's unusual, but it is consistent. Um, even if it never happened in the real world, it would still be consistent because you'd need to, again, to know some facts about the weather um, to know that they that, that um, they weren't both true at the same time. It's nothing about the logical form that guarantees that they're inconsistent. Right? Why don't you pause the video and think about three, four, and five? Let's see. Number three says, uh, A says, if it rains, I will wear a raincoat. B says, if I do not wear a raincoat, then it is not raining. These two sentences are equivalent. They're logically equivalent. Um, every, in every case where, if it rains, I will wear a raincoat is true. If I do not wear a raincoat, then it is not raining is also true. And every, every case in which A is false, B is also false, right? Um, what about number four? Um, number four is uh, kind of depends on the meaning of the words comprise and compose. Um, that is, um, if A comprises B, then B composes A. Um, those are complementary terms. You might say, well, isn't that some outside factual information I need to know? But we typically, you know, we acknowledge that that, that, kind, of, that kind of word, the is relevant to the logical meaning, right? So we would say these are equivalent, right? Um, to say a house comprises several rooms is to say a house is made up of several rooms. To say several rooms compose a house is to say that several rooms make up a house, right? And so made up by and make up, they go together, right? Um, what about number five? A, this three sentences here, they say it is warm, it is cool, it is tepid. Right? Are those consistent, inconsistent, or logically equivalent? You might think it is consistent, right? If you don't know anything about temperatures, you don't know whether it's it's true. Maybe you know it feels warm to me. It feels cool to you. It feels tepid to Alice. Um, you know, they're consistent. You might think that um, warm, cool, and tepid are, are kind of mutually exclusive terms, just like raining and not raining. And that might make you think these are inconsistent, right? Um, not on the basis of, of facts about thermodynamics or whatever, but just in terms of the, the terms are kind of contraries or complements to each other. They're, they're mutually exclusive. Um, it's a bit of a trick. I mean, it depends on how we uh, interpret these terms. I think it's probably best to see these as consistent, but it would be possible to represent them um, in, a, in a logical form that, that makes them mutually exclusive, in which case we would have to say they're inconsistent. I just use a concept of logical form, so let's talk about that. Logical form is the part of a sentence or an argument that has to do just with its logical structure, not its content, right? Just, just the 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 part of the, um, the argument or the sentence that has to do with concepts like truth value, logical consistency, et cetera, that, don't have, that we don't have to look outside of the sentence to understand, that, um, that uh, really gets at this sort of formal structural information, right? Um, and then a formal language is a language typically an artificial human created language that tries to capture the logical forms of everyday language while abstracting everything else away. Everything that has to do just with the content is, is abstracted away. Formal languages are usually made up of things like atoms, connectives, inference rules. Um, there are many different formal languages out there. Um, 
There's uh, categorical or syllogistic logic, sometimes called Aristotelian logic, is a very simple formal language and very old. Um, the two formal languages we will use in this class are called in the book sentential logic or SL and quantified logic or QL. Um, all, in other in other um, in other books or by other people, they might be called propositional logic and predicate logic or first order logic. Um, those are just a, different names for the same type of formal language. There are other formal languages, modal logics, deontic logics, um, uh, mathematics um, um, is, is typically a formal language, formal mathematics uh, made up of formal languages. No formal language captures all of the interesting formal, logical formal structure um, in ordinary language or, or, or other kinds of discourse. The reason there are many different kinds of formal languages is that each captures different kinds of formal structures. Um, the formal languages are kind of models of language or models of discourse. They're abstractions that are useful for different purposes, but there is no kind of one best formal language that serves all purposes equally well. Right? An important property of formal language um, that some formal languages have, that the formal languages we look at in this course have, is bivalence. We say a formal language is bivalent if um, no, if every sentence has a single truth value that is either true or false, right? In a bivalent language, no statement is neither true nor false. No sentence is both true and false, it has to be one or the other, not both, not neither. Those are all the options. Those are both, those two are the only options, right? Um, not all formal languages are bivalent. They're trivalent, they're, they're, they're paraconsistent. There are all kinds of other formal languages that have different properties, not bivalence. Um, bivalence is uh, a kind of, you know, simplifying assumption. Um, but it's a powerful one. It's, it's an important one. Um, and it's, uh, we'll see ways in which it's useful. It helps us um, understand a lot about the kind of arguments we typically make in a lot of ordinary situations. Um, contingent sentences in a formal language might take on different truth values depending on other facts, right? In, in different situations, maybe but they can only have one truth value at a time. That's the assumption of bivalence. So those are the key concepts that we're, we, um, I wanted to cover today that, are, that help set the stage for the investigation of formal languages that we'll do in subsequent units in this class. If you have any questions about what we talked about today, please feel free to reach out to me, come by my office hours, send me an email or a message. Um, or you could pose the question to on Discord. Um, if you don't, if you, it's a concept in this lecture that you're struggling with, you could discuss it on Discord with other students and I will weigh in there as well. Um, that might help sort of, uh, other students might have a way of putting it that could help you if you pose the question the right way. Um, before we end today, I wanna to come back to our, our logic puzzle, right? So let's have another look at this. Um, did you figure it out? Once you have a guess, I'm not going to, again, I'm not going to tell you today which it is, but once you have a guess, I encourage you to um, go to the Logic Puzzles channel on our class Discord server and share your solution. But make sure you use the spoiler tag on Discord um, to, uh, to, um, uh, sort of mask your solution so that other people have a chance to guess before they see your answer to the logic puzzle. Okay. Um, so that's our discussion for today. I hope that that uh, was helpful for you. Um, and I wish you good luck with, uh, with the quiz, with the practice problems and the, and the exam for, for this unit. Um, and I look forward to uh, to seeing you um, in the lecture for the next unit. Uh, all right, bye.